So first of all, it's that's not my job. Yeah, of like, course. But like, come on, <laughs> you get rumors, you get speculation. Hello and welcome back to another episode of the Cardboard Herald, my chance to talk with creative gamers and game creators, and I am so excited to be joined by Journeys in Middle Earth co-designer Grace Holdinghouse. Welcome to the show, Grace. Hi, happy to be here. Yeah, this is cool. You are the first in-house FFG designer that I've had on the show. I've had a couple past FFG people, but you're the first one who's actually on the crew at the time of speaking. But anyway, of course, the big thing that that everyone wants to know about is Journeys in Middle Earth, and I do want to hit on that, but I want to have a little primer here on you. So let's set our baseline. What got you into board games? Well, I played a few board games growing up with my parents, but I think that my first real foray into hobby games as an industry, as this big phenomena, was in college. I went to college in uh, Beloit, Wisconsin, and joined a club called the Beloit Science Fiction and Fantasy Association, or BISFA for short. That's amazing. Oh, yeah. It was a wild time. We ran 12 events a week, and some of those were board games. (laughs) Okay. Okay. And so what were the other things? Science fiction related and fantasy related? Were you doing like academic deep readings of classic literature? Well, we were doing whatever our members wanted to do. And I think at our like largest, we had maybe a fourth of the campus, like teachers and janitors and security guards coming to our events because wow. we would like nerf nights or LARP or we would throw like ballroom parties or we would, you know, Doctor Who classic over pancakes on Sundays. Like it was a fun time. That sounds delicious and amazing. What was the thing that actually got you into designing board games? It was kind of a whim. Uh, (laughs) So I uh, graduated college and didn't really have an idea what to do with myself. What was your major? Uh, I double majored in cognitive science and creative writing. Okay. All right. Okay. (laughs) I can see that as like foundational levels of like, you know, priming you for getting into board game design. I'm glad you see the logic in it. (laughs) But uh, I guess I had a vague notion that I might work in a comic book store and uh, nothing (laughs) like that panned out because, you know, there are no jobs that exist after college, it seems. And then I saw that the same company made all of my favorite board games, and they were offering an internship. So I applied, and, well, one thing led to another, and I'm here. What year was that? Oh, gosh. Uh, 2014? 2014. 2014. So you were there during the transition from FFG to Asmodee North America, right? Yep. I actually I got hired when we were moving offices, and for, like, the first week, I did not have a desk. Wow. Okay. So do you think that um, as far as witnessing kind of that evolution, it it sounds like you were just in the midst of that, that process. Do you feel like through talking to your companions, your coworkers there, other interns maybe, that there was a change of cultures? Or do you think that Asmodee stepped in and really wanted to preserve the essence of FFG? That's a tricky question. I do think that um, as we've gotten larger, as we've just hired more people, more developers, designers, producers, artists, graphic designers, um, we've had to change how the company functions. We've gotten much better at communicating with each other and you know, running things smoothly. Um, and that's been really great to see, taking these strides to make sure that uh, We host events where everyone can attend and all the voices are heard. Um, Being able to see us make these really great um, games, uh, collaborating on them. There's been such growth that when I think about like five years ago, I don't know if I would have been able to predict it. Right, right. And there's a huge changing of the guard recently. I mean, uh, of course, Christian Peterson retiring and then Corey Knitska has now gone off to found his own studio within Asmodee. Has that been a pretty significant shift or had an impact on you as a designer there? Interesting. Well, 
Not a huge impact, I would say. I think that um, it's overall part of this reshifting, ever growing, morphing landscape of the industry as a whole. I think that like Kickstarter growing and becoming a huge thing and uh, more uh, gaming cafes opening up, all of these influences within the industry uh, affect all of us. And I think this is just one of more thing. P.S. Corey, of course, is still kind of around. We still, you know, hear from him. It's same as Andrew. And I don't know. I think it's just all part of one big thing. See, the shocking thing to me is how you're describing this kind of feels like an administration change working in state <laughs> government, which is what I'm familiar with. And it's just like, yeah, some people change, but overall you have a lot of familiar faces and you still have your job, your objective. And, you know, unless you're at the really, really high level, that's not going to have a significant impact on your day to day, which is kind of awesome. I, I, I kind of like when really awesome and interesting industries and hobbies have a degree of mundane to them not in a boring way but in like a yeah this is my job and i just do my job and i try to do my job well i drink my coffee i look forward to the weekend yeah that seems pretty cool sure i also think that um it's a testament to how i guess um still small we are as an industry still still niche because you see the same people all of the time. You hear the same names. We're all bumping elbows and like bouncing ideas off of each other. And that's a really dynamic, close uh, environment to work in. Right, right. Well, if this was your entry point into designing board games and you got hired as an intern and eventually as a staff member at FFG, just so we have some context, what kind of games or maybe even a specific game really inspires you to be a better designer? Something that you look at and you're like, oh man, if I could design something like that, then I would know that I've really made it. Sure. I guess the games, oh, the games that really inspire me uh, are always ones that do something that pushes the boundaries of what we think of as game mechanics okay and the ones that i think of first are like um fog of love or dixit or uh legacy of dragonhold that uh nikki valens was designing while i was here and uh the mind like these games that really make you ask is that really a board game yeah yeah it, it's kind of Wild. I've talked about this before, but especially in cooperative games right now, I mean, it's all over in competitive games and, and all sorts of uh, styles of game. But I've noticed that especially in cooperative games, which at first, of course, you had Lord of the Rings, the Kinesia Lord of the Rings, and then you have coming after that pandemic. And for a while, cooperative games kind of felt like they had to be pandemic influenced or they had to do something that was specifically contradicting what pandemic said as the template but over maybe the last like four years the types of cooperative experiences that could be had in in games is so varied and and diverse there's huge long sprawling strategy games there's really quick easy to play entry level games there's all kinds of stuff and i i really love that kind of experimentation too and i love seeing that fantasy flight is still trying to do that stuff especially with for example legacy of dragon isn't it incredible i think that um what we've really seen is a widening and broadening of the types of games that can be supported and mm -hmm. like as soon as you see a designer doing something so off the wall and incredible it makes you wonder like well, what if I could just do something like this? <laughs> <laughs> I guess that would work. Right, right. Well, let's talk about Journeys in Middle Earth. So it's no secret that this is one of my favorite games of the year. I am a huge Lord of the Rings fan, but also I am pretty critical, I think, of anyone who wants to take steps into that world, into that environment. And, you know, while I, I want to see new interesting ideas... I also want to see people really think about what they're doing. And I think Journeys mm -hmm. in Middle Earth really succeeded. It's a wonderful game and oh, congratulations gosh. on the success on that. 
Thank you so much. It, it means a lot because I completely understand this uh, very foundational work that, of course, J.R.R. Tolkien created this world that people grew up with. Mm -hmm. And it founded not only, you know, this game, of course, but also an entire genre of, of fantasy literature, of gaming, like right. World of everything right and, and I, i'm not so precious as to say like everything has to have a reverent tone for the professor <laughs> tolkien you know i would love to see a very cartoony take on lord of the rings or you know hell yeah the silmarillion if it were like <laughs> adventure time meets tolkien how cool would that be oh. but you know still having thought about you know how you're going into this rather than just saying I don't know, generic fantasy, and it happens to be involving a ring, and you got to throw it in some hot stuff. Sure, yeah. But let's talk about the Genesis. Did you seek out designing a Lord of the Rings game, or was this an assignment handed to you? A little bit of both. So <laughs> what I knew, <laughs> not a very useful answer, I know. Uh, what I was looking for was a game that I could be part of from the ground up, that I could really get my hands into the core design of and take from nothing to an entire line, mm -hmm. right? That is something that I hadn't done before as a designer. I was really excited to try. And my manager comes to me and goes, so how do you feel about Lord of the Rings? And I go, what do you mean, how do I feel about Lord of the Rings? <laughs> I love it. Come on. Come on. But I hadn't actually anticipated being able to work in it. Like, that's not something that had crossed my mind, really, at that point. Um, but when I got the chance, it was daunting but incredibly exciting. And I was very happy to jump on the project with uh, my wonderful co-designer, Nathan Hodjack, and take it from there. Do you know if this started as FFG saying we need a new adventure style game, kind of a quasi dungeon crawl, and they were looking at different properties or perhaps an original IP and eventually landed on Lord of the Rings? Or did this start as Lord of the Rings, we haven't done anything new with it in a while, so let's see what we can come up with, and eventually you settled on this style of game? So, first of all, it's... That's not my job. Yeah, uh, of course, but come on. <laughs> you get rumors, you get speculation. Sure, I do think that um, the core, the seed idea came from we knew we wanted to do another app-integrated board game that was app-integrated from day one, like Mansions of Madness 2nd Edition. Right. Um, yeah. That we wanted to create a new game that really relied on this marriage between digital and physical. Um, because we already had mansions, we already had Imperial Assault being worked on, we already had uh, Road to Legend and all of these things, Lord of the Rings was obvious. They're like, oh, of course we should do this. Of course. It's It was a great decision, in my opinion. <laughs> You guys have been looking at all of my forum posts where I've been like, where is Middle Earth Quest 2.0? Come on, we need it. FFG, get on top of this. And they were like, dude, this Cardboard Herald guy, you know, he's got some <laughs> ideas over here. Catering just to him. So when in the process of developing this game did the separation between the adventure and battle maps come along? Because I, I think while it's not as big of a mechanical shift because overall the game follows the same fundamental mechanics the perspective allows for an interesting narrative shift and so tonally it creates a different story for that adventure was that an idea from the get-go was that something that was born out of necessity tell me about it yeah that was a really early core idea um we knew that we wanted a game that did something different, and this idea was floated of, well, what if there were two different game boards? Like, you had these tiles, and then you had this, like, actual board. Mm -hmm. um, and could we do that with an app? What can we do with that? And um, Nathan uh, really had a good point that the books really display this uh, breadth of, of time. Mm -hmm. Where mm -hmm. if you take one page, sometimes that's a whole week. Right. And sometimes it's a few moments in a pitched battle. And 
we needed a way to represent both of those accurately for the player because those are both very important for the Lord of the Rings experience. So we, we came up with the uh, battle map and journey map and over testing decided what worked best was this adventure is a journey map and this adventure is a battle map <laughs> and never the twain shall meet. <laughs> <laughs> Did you ever toy with other perspectives, either for developing the game as it is right now and you just ended up scrapping it, or maybe for future mechanics? Like, was there ever an in-between or even a, a further obfuscated map that's like all of Middle-earth? I think one of the main struggles as a designer is knowing uh, when to stop designing. <laughs> like, <laughs> yeah, yeah, no kidding. <laughs> So the the short answer is yes. Uh, coming like making sure that we are open to all of the crazy ideas that might become really cool mechanics for this game, being open to the possibilities of all of the content we could do, and then really being able to focus and pick out a few gems and say, this deserves some time and work and effort to really make shine because this is going to be the core fun of this game. Um, and that's what gets included in a finalized product. So uh, the perspective shifts that we have, I think, um, were the gems that we, we plucked out and decided like, ah, yes, this is our baby that we will nurture. <laughs> And you do a lot with it. Like, I, I was really interested to see that a couple missions in, there's almost an entirely, well, I guess this is a slight spoiler. There's like a, a non-combative mission, which I was blown away by. I was like, what are they doing here? This completely contradicts my expectations. And then if anything else, it made me eager to see what sorts of creative things that you were cooking up for expansion content because i i gotta imagine that when working on expansions that's where you can get a little buck wild you have your core experience <laughs> satisfy the audience but then you can be like hey let's get this weird thing on over here and oh yeah i gotta imagine with the success you've been working on a lot of expansion stuff <laughs> I've been super fortunate to be able to continue working on Journeys in Middle Earth because you're right, the design space is so large and there's so much content from the books and of course like original content that we can come up with that we could go anywhere. We could do so many things. And I think my past experience, I uh, started work as a game developer on Manchester Madness 2nd Edition mm -hmm. and that really informed some of my senses of where we could go. Um, a lot of mansion scenarios start with this idea of like, sure, there's a mystery, uh, but this one's gonna be like a gang war, or this one's gonna be all about snakes or whatever. Like right, uh, right. The, the things that we can do with the app specifically make me really excited because it allows us to do things that you really couldn't see in a normal board game. Speaking of original content, let's talk about some beefs here. I mean, you already know I really like the game, but that doesn't mean that I everything settled perfectly with me. So one thing that I talked about in my own review for this was that I, I was kind of disappointed that I was playing as Bilbo and Aragorn and Legolas. As much as I really love those characters, it's hard for me to embody this world that I know so well, knowing this kind of contradicts fundamental aspects of their story. And I know FFG in the past has done kind of pastiches of other characters, Imperial Assault and Middle Earth Quest. They had their analogs to the characters from the, the work that they were adapting while not using those characters specifically. Was that a big decision for you guys? Did you ever consider having fully original characters as opposed to the named characters from the story? Tell me about what went into that decision. Sure, happy to. I think uh, we were always going to strike that middle road mm -hmm. to try to uh, really make a good compromise for all of our potential fans, because we know how much people care about Lord of the Rings, and we know how fundamental it is to some people and their their expression of, of fandom. And uh, at least me coming at this, uh, I imagined this fan picking up a beautiful game box and going, "Yeah, Lord of the Rings game. What do you mean it doesn't have Gimli in it? I want to play." <laughs> 
my favorite. And of course, the converse with uh, someone picking up this game and going, Gimli wouldn't be doing this. So we wanted there to be both options. We didn't want to lock anyone into an experience that they wouldn't find fun. We want to empower our players to play the way that they find most fun. Right, right. And that makes sense. And I, I recognize the that there has to be a compromise somewhere. And ultimately, I know that I could get past it as big of a fan of the Lord of the Rings and all of the Middle Earth works as I am. I was still able to go, you know what? What if this is like a Marvel's what if? If uh, Bilbo <laughs> sure. was running around with Strider hanging out and you know, slaying a bunch of orcs or something. But let's talk about another aspect of the development of this game. It's a fail forward game. And that's something that I really love. And I think that it is handled so beautifully in the the way that the campaign unfolds. And I think that's really encouraging. And I think that that's kind of my expectation for going forward with cooperative campaign games these days i i don't want to fail a mission at the very end and go like Ugh, okay well we're going to have to set up and replay that all over again but the flip side of that probably the most challenging thing is how do you handle the final mission and mm. making it feel like it was a, a satisfying conclusion even if the players lose you've spent so much time investing into this and then you get to the final mission and then if that's the mission you fail and you have no option of replaying unless you go through 14 campaign chapters all over again, then it can kind of leave you at, at a low note. So what were some of the the sacrifices that you had to make to, to get it to the, the way that it came out? What were some sure. of the decisions that went into that? Yeah, I think that um, one of the first decisions that we had to make was how replayable do we make this? Mm -hmm. Because you can spend decades creating content for this kind of project, every branching path, every meticulously written uh, conversation tree, or you can say, this is more of a legacy game. Once you play it, you know all the secrets. You have unlocked your experience and it's special and unique. And why would you ever Mm -hmm. redo it um and i think that we really wanted to emphasize this idea that um the app lets you kind of have both kind of uh know that if you did replay it it was going to be a unique experience that you were going to see new events meet new characters gain new items uh be able to make different choices and those would be important and impactful but also that the experience that you just had of this very, you know, rich story was complete, that uh, you made the choices that you made and those characters developed in a unique way and that that mattered and was fulfilling um, as a player and as someone who cares about stories. Uh, and I do think that um, there was a point in development where Nathan and I we're kind of at a crossroads and we go, okay, how do we let someone play just one adventure? Just <laughs> pick an adventure and play it. How do we do this? And it was such a thorny problem at the time because there was a lot of decisions that needed to be made about how the app could be built, how all of these wonderful story decisions and things that you had found that paid off did you save the life of this ranger or did you not? How are you going to input all of those to then make that end scenario playable? All the story decisions then had to funnel down into something. Did we just make those decisions for you and say, no, this is the right way to play this adventure? Or did we say, well, you have to have known the ranger at some point for that to matter in the end. So if she's going to show up, you have to have played that adventure first. So we, we ended on a uh, more narrative, more story important uh, and more uh, thorny decision of this campaign can only be played as a campaign. Now, 
of course, when you're developing a game, you're, you're thinking about all of the experiences that you intend players to have, but then it comes out and then you get a massive amount of feedback. I don't know if you're the type of creative person who just stays away from reviews and comments and all that kind of stuff. But if I'm if I'm right, I'm betting that some of that stuff is inescapable. So mm. are there elements of the game that either through expansions or or through just personal, I guess, uh, discovery of like, man, I wish I had done that a little bit differently <laughs> that that you've thought about as part of like player feedback to the game? Interesting. I, the points as a developer that I always agonize the most over um, are always quantity of content based. Mm -hmm. uh, when I look at a box and I realize that feasibly I can only include, for instance, six heroes in this core set. What do you mean I can only choose six? <laughs> That's ridiculous. And then I have to make those hard choices and inevitably there's something that I go well this isn't gone forever this is just going to go in a different box <laughs> I can't let go of it yet um, or something that occurs to me later too late for that perfect moment and okay well I'm, gonna, I'm just going to do that in the future I don't ever think that there's going to be a time when I look at Journeys in Middle Earth and go well that's it. There's nothing more to do. We're finished. It's complete. Right, right. Because <laughs> there's just so much. Was there anything in particular that was a hard sacrifice to make throughout the uh, design of this game? Maybe it was like an administrative decision that came from on top. Like, yeah, that's not feasible to produce because of uh, it, it would cost too much to make. Was it a, a specific mechanical element? Is there anything that you can share without getting in trouble by your <laughs> FFG masters uh, that, that you wish you could have included, but ultimately for the better game, for the right game, you had to leave it on the cutting room floor? Well, I think I've touched a little bit on like, well, how, how do we do it all? How do we, right. you know, allow players to do whatever they want in their, you know, best ideal play experience? And you can't ever create that perfect game. You're always going to try, of course, but it's always going to be just like, oh, if only I could make all of these people happy. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but uh, I think that with Journeys in Middle Earth specifically, uh, we would be designing something like a, an adventure and it would uh, strike us like, oh, what what if we did this? And it'd be too late. Like, <laughs> we, we got to get the game, you know, so that people can actually play it. And I think that um, those kinds of uh, last minute realizations of like, oh, but what if we, those will always show up sometime else in either an expansion or uh, potentially even another game because the nature of working at FFG means we're all collaborating and, you know, we play test each other's stuff. So ideas spread. <laughs> Was there ever a particular challenge that you guys were really struggling with as you were developing this game and then you had that aha moment where you're like, yes, this is the solution to move forward? Well, I think we were struggling a little bit on uh, testing because does it feel better to flip three cards or four? Does it feel better to like... It can be really hard to get those those tiny minute decisions that can be so impactful because they're the core of the game mm -hmm. uh, just right and i think um uh cory canesco was was play testing with us and i think made a, a comment to nathan about how well this is this is too complex right now what if we just made this simpler and that was an aha moment that was definitely the right direction to go i 
got to imagine just designing games on its own is very difficult. And especially when you are designing within the structure of a big company that has a, a lot of expectations, though also you have a lot of resources. And then you add on top of that the fact that you are designing a game with app integration. And maybe I'm making some assumptions here because you and your co-designer are in my brains first and foremost cardboard monkeys you know people working with the paper side of things but are there particular challenges and struggles that come with designing a game where there's a fundamental aspect that you aren't actually the person designing it this is probably my favorite question uh <laughs> I think that you'd be a little surprised by how much actual digital work Nathan and I did and do. That's great. Uh, <laughs> I mean, when we set out to make an app integrated board game, we all sit down together and we go, okay, we need this game to do X, Y, and Z. And, you know, you'll be in charge of X and I'll be in charge of Y. And like, we all need to collaborate together and it all needs to work as a game. And so you end up, having your hands in all different sorts of pies. And uh, I know that when I work on an app integrated board game, the constraints of what can the app do are a lot like what can these physical components do? <laughs> the <laughs> yeah. mechanic that you scrap because it's gonna take 10 more cards than will fit in your box is a lot like the mechanic that you scrap because you can't have tokens hovering and flashing green or something. Well, let's talk about those pies here as a, as a good way to kind of conclude, because in my hands right now, I have the Villains of Eriador pack, which is a cool little, I, I guess, fun size nugget of additional content. It, it has some, some characters or I guess rather some enemy figures that can be used in the campaign. It's not necessarily needed and it works uh, with the Ember Crown campaign as well. And then you have a, a few extra cards in there and those are cool little additions, but come on, man. I want <laughs> big stuff. Tell me about what is in the future for Journeys in Middle Earth. You know, what are the, the big content plans here to the degree that you can actually talk about it? Sure. Obviously, I can't say too much about things that are still in development and not officially announced. But uh, recently, Andrew Navarro did do an Ask Me Anything where he mentioned the big box that is coming. Uh, Journeys in Middle Earth will be having a very big expansion that I... I'm dying for it to be announced because I really think that people are going to be excited about what we've done with it and just how much of it there is. <laughs> so believe me, it's, it's coming. We're going to tell you more about it soon. And can you speak to what at least a, a hopeful an optimistic schedule for this game would be like, is there going to be a good mix of big box content, smaller figure packs like this, as well as digital releases like the Ember Crown DLC, or is there a specific type that you expect people should be looking forward to? Oh, well, I think that um, after the course that uh, released, we had, the wonderful Hunt for the Ember Crown DLC, as you mentioned, and its villain pack. And now we're going to get a big box. And so that's already four different types of expansions. And I don't, you know, see us abandoning any of those. Uh, they work well for app-integrated board games. They let people uh, play the game in different ways and at different levels. And I know that as a designer, um, I really enjoy having um, the breadth of different content to work on because designing a DLC campaign uh, and only having to worry about really making those adventures shine and how it all connects together in unique ways, that's an interesting design problem. Whereas uh, Big Box with all of its new content, uh, that's also an interesting design problem, but that's very different um, because it does have to also have a campaign uh, that works with all of that new content. Speaking of which, I do have to say that first mission of the Ember Crown campaign is a killer 
prologue to a, any sort of campaign. Like, I, I really enjoyed the base campaign, and I thought there was a cool story there, but it was a little predictable of like, all right, we got to hit on some of the, the touchstones of Lord of the Rings and, you know, getting into Middle Earth here, and we have some hobbits and yada, yada, yada. But man, that first mission for Ember Crown, I was like, oh, this could go anywhere. What is going on? <laughs> And it felt like, like I said earlier, you know, you get to kind of play with things a little bit narratively and, and like the the parameters. And I was really impressed with how that felt familiar, but also set the expectation that this is going to be a little bit different than what you experienced during the initial campaign. Oh, I'm so excited. Like that is always the goal so that we can always provide something that will surprise and delight that I'm so happy to hear. So of the initial set of characters, the six characters that are in the base game, which one are you most likely to cosplay as? Ooh, that is a great question. <laughs> I mean, I've always seen myself as a hobbit, so perhaps Bilbo is most likely, um, but I think I'd have the most fun with Elena because... As someone who mains Bard, I have many songs that I can sing. <laughs> oh, man. Great musician. I would love to see that someday. But then again, I think with the right beard, you could make it a very striking Gimli. Just saying, you know, it's out there. Everything's possible. I, you know, I've done some big beard work before, so that's, you know, possible. Well, Grace, are there any other projects at FFG that you can speak to, or is your time right now fully dedicated to just all ships ahead, journeys in Middle Earth? 100% journeys in Middle Earth, 100% of the time. I work in the app, I get bug reports and I fix them, and it's all fun. Well, you know that I am on board with the game, and so I'm going to be checking out what comes on the horizon. I do want to say thank you to FFG for not releasing like 16,000 little individual figure packs like you guys did with Star Wars. <laughs> Please do not start doing that with this because, man, I don't want to try and keep up with that. And at a certain point, you get overwhelmed and you're like, just, just I don't want to bother with it. I am excited. <laughs> for what plans are on the horizon here for Journeys in Middle-Earth. And so I'm excited that I will have lots to talk to you about in the future. Thanks for coming on the show, Grace. I've been pleased as punch to be here. Thank you so much, Jack. If you enjoyed this video, we have all kinds of other reviews, interviews, and recommendations via writing, podcasts, and video here on our channel and website, CardboardHerald.com. Our content is audience supported, so if you want to show your support, please visit our Patreon. Thank you so much for watching. This has been the Cardboard Herald.